So right off the bat, just quickly, so we're not confused, uh, this is the structure uh, of, uh, this is where Sidewalk Lab fits. It, it's an alphabet company. Uh, you're probably a little bit familiar with the new structure, so kind of a sibling of Google. Um, but we're particularly focused on making cities better, and we're gonna talk a lot about cities and, and urban technology today. Um, since we're starting to talk about cities, I, I sort of wanted to get a sense of the audience. So how many of you live in New York City? Oh wow, like, Almost 100%. I, I can't even tell whether there's no hands up. Um, and uh, how many of you were born outside New York City? Wow, that's actually a huge, that's almost, who was born in New York City? Oh, wow, look at you. Yeah, welcome, welcome, people from New York City. Um, who was born outside the US? Uh, that's, that's actually probably a slightly higher percentage than New York as a whole. I think New York is about 40% foreign born. So. Actually, I'm kind of interested. What, obviously, we all, it sounds like we all, it looks like we almost all moved to New York. Some of you just sort of stayed put, but the vast majority of us moved here voluntarily. What, what drew you to New York or, or to cities? Like, what's your favorite thing about a city? Any, any? The grid. The grid. People love the grid. Any, any other, yeah. Public transit. Public transit is awesome. I agree. Work. Work, right. There are jobs here. That's a good thing, actually. That's important, yeah. The people are fantastic, yes, exactly, I agree, yeah. Social, yeah, it's super social. Even just walking down the street is social. Restaurants, hmm? Couture, culture, yeah, exactly. Okay, fantastic, I, yeah, one last one. Pay for, <laughs> I've, got, I've got good and bad news for you later on. Um, so, um, you know, my favorite thing about New York City, honestly, is just walking down the street. Uh, you know, sort of pick some random uh, destination, or as, as Nick said, go to Happy Bones. Um, this, this talk is not about plugging my cafe, but um, go to a random, you know, head to a random location, and dollars to donuts, on the way, you'll discover something you've never seen before, somebody doing something crazy, some new little store or, you know, park or whatever. You know, I just love that kind of novelties, you know, never far away in New York City. So, um, okay, so, so let's talk about technology and New York. So does anybody know what this is? Very good, that's pretty fast. Yeah, transistor. That's a transistor. Um, that's, uh, that's kind of impressive. It, so who, who invented, uh, what organization invented the transistor? AT&T Bell, AT Bell Labs, exactly. So, so an interesting thing, you know, these days you kind of think about Bell Labs as something, you know, in New Jersey. But um, originally, Bell Labs was based right here in, in New York City. In fact, like about you know, three or 400 yards that way, south or west from, from the building we're in at the moment. So Bell Labs was based uh, in New York from the late 1890s to about 1966. In the 40s, it started moving out. And over that time, Bell Labs invented things like uh, it was the largest industrial research center in the US and invented uh, automatic telephone panel switches, which is kind of obvious the first experimental talking movies, black and white TV and color TV, and in fact, they developed radar during the Second World War. They are called upon to help with the war effort, and most of the radar development went, across, went on in the Chelsea Market Building across the street, which used to be a Nabisco factory. Uh, Google's now partly in the building. Vacuum tube, commercial broadcasts, and so on, even part of the Manhattan Project. Um, so you'll notice there's a train running through the building, uh, and so it's interesting how that train line basically over time you know, fell into disuse and has now been redeveloped as a high line. So there's kind of a line from this amazing early technology uh, that happened right here in New York City um, and then sort of fell into, into uh, a sort of a, a, a slow period for technology in New York. Um, but now New York's redeveloping that whole area. But when I moved back to New York, I moved out to California to join Google in 2000, my wife Kirsten and I moved back in 2003 because we were desperate to, to start living in New York again. And the New York Times published this piece, and one of the things they said was, you sort of have to read this in like an Eeyore voice, with the technology startup boom over, the term Silicon Alley is fading into history, leaving behind a New York industry, industry, internet industry that offers little excitement. So that was kind of the tech scene in 2003. So things have come down a long way since you know the 40s when this was like the center of technology, IBM Research and, and Bell Labs and other companies. Um, so fast forward 30, that's by the way, uh, obligatory photo of me and, and Craig Silverstein. Uh, Craig was the first employee at Google. <clears throat> and when we, when we came out, we got our photo taken to sort of commemorate the event, sitting on obviously like exercise balls in the middle of Times Square. Um, 16 years later, uh, this is a map of uh, tech startups and 
uh, and tech events like this one right here in, in New York City. And you can see at the top, this is uh, counting, I, I rearranged the UI a little bit, thousands and thousands and thousands of companies and events. And you all are testament to that, right? Tech in New York City is kind of amazing now. Um, there's a lot of incredible stuff going on. So in a way, cities have done incredible things for tech, not only in New York City, but around the world. Silicon Roundabout in London. Um, there's not a huge tech scene in Auckland, but uh, you know, Berlin, San Francisco, uh, the city itself, Tokyo, uh, Sydney, and so on. So cities have done a lot for tech in the last decade or so. The question now that we're trying to address at Sidewalk is, what can tech do for cities? So let's rewind a little bit, maybe a couple of hundred years, to the late 18th century, so 1700s, and let's look at some of the, the impacts that technology has had on cities already. Not computer technology, but in this example, steam technology, which gave us essentially the Industrial Revolution. So suddenly, people were able to move around cities and between cities much more easily, no longer at the speed of walking or the speed of a horse, but at the, st the speed of a train driven like by a steam engine. Um, probably even more importantly, <clears throat> it was now possible to be incredibly productive in a small space because of the leveraging power that all that steam power gave us. But of course there were downsides, so incredible pollution uh, and the coal burning and the health impacts of people being crowded so close together. There were some pretty negative aspects of, of the Industrial Revolution. So 100 years later, <clears throat> actually in New York with Edison, uh, grid electricity came to the world, uh, which enabled for example, elevators, and elevators enabled very tall buildings. And then all of a sudden, in the late 19th century, it was possible to build these incredibly tall buildings, and many of them are in downtown Manhattan. But pretty quickly, people realized that, I don't know if anybody knows the equitable building down, down, downtown. Essentially, if you build a whole bunch of these buildings that are 50 or 100 floors high, even though you can, maybe you shouldn't, because it blocks out all the light and actually reduces quality of life. So the automobile, another amazing invention, and through the beginning of the 20th century, but really taking off in the post-war years, the automobile allowed people, regular people, to get around with immense freedom. So no longer were they having to go wherever the train told them they could go. They could drive wherever they wanted, and the development of, of interstates um, and the automobile meant that, that Americans and people around the world had access to enormous freedoms. The ability, for example, to commute uh, from their home to, to their office in, in places like New York. So it seemed kind of wonderful. Well, so wonderful, in fact, that it seemed like a good idea to put a, to, for Robert Moses to put a, a, a basically a, a highway through the center of Manhattan, th right through the middle of Greenwich Village. And fortunately, that didn't happen. But what did happen is lots and lots and lots of traffic and lots and lots and lots of space devoted to roads and to parking, which we'll tell more about. So. History shows that technology can be an immense boon for cities, but there's also, we have to be pretty careful uh, because there are actually some pretty negative consequences that can come from, uh, from technology, and Anand's gonna tell us a bit more about that. Thanks, Greg. Okay, he, he'll be back. Yeah. Uh, so I wanna talk about the fourth revolution that we're, we're seeing in cities, and um, this isn't really you know, just about you know, sidewalk labs. I think I think when we we talk about this, you'll see um, examples that all of us can relate to. And um, we're we're calling this sort of reimagining the city as a digital platform. Uh, you, know, it's important to start by 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 saying that the cities themselves have always been platforms. You know, they're they're places where we pull together. We We've built roads, we, we build sewers, and we fund all of that through taxes, and that enables all kinds of you know, users and businesses to come together in the same way that we think about other kinds of technology platforms. Um, but until recently, you know, digital technologies were sort of an afterthought in city design. And, um, and what, what I want to talk about a little bit is, is when digital technologies become a peer with concrete and with laws and regulation and taxes, what, what happens? You know, how does that change cities? And before doing that, I think it's worth you know, talking about uh, great platforms that, that we all know and love in the digital world and th the potential that they've had and, and actual you know, change they, they've really, really sort of undertook. And so I want to talk a few, about a few of these. First off, on the left here, we've got you know, virtualization, server virtualization. You know, led to dramatic efficiencies in you know how we run application. Um, we have you know, the web and Google and search engines, which 
lets incredible ad ad adaptability for content creators and the ability to discover knowledge from around the world. You have the App Store, which has allowed an incredible community of developers to reach uh, users all, all around the world. You know, you know, it's like 100 million apps in the App Store now. And then lastly, you have the cloud. The, you know, this is sort of the ability for um, you know, per minute billing and uh, you know, per second billing now in some cases with you know, places like Amazon and Google uh, allows any developer to go write a server application for, for pennies to get started. And, and these digital platforms have really had transformative change both within uh, the IT world but also you know, spanning into other sectors. And you know, we, we think we're at the very early stages of digital technologies being able to have similar amounts of transformative change in cities. And one, one way to kind of gauge this um, is, uh, is to talk about sort of our, the user experience of the city and, and how, it's, how it's really changing. Um, so Kevin Lynch was an MIT, I think an urban planner from MIT. He wrote a book in 1960 called uh, The Image of the City. And it's a really interesting book. It was, it, was, it was based on a survey, I think, I don't know how many different people in three cities. And he basically just interviewed them and asked them um, to kind of play back what their mental perception of the city was that they lived in, you know, just kind of through spoken interviews. And he kind of paid attention and he observed for uh, you know, the, what, what indicators they use to describe their life in the city. And he came up with these kinds, of sort of five um, you know, types of physical identifiers that people would reference. Uh, the path, which is pretty straightforward, you walk down, walk down a path. The edge, which is sort of a boundary between two different areas in a city. The node, a crossing point, think about going through uh, you know, a train station, for example district, kind of like a neighborhood and landmark, large physical physical landmarks. And um, and you know, these were, you know, by definition, physical physical objects by and large. And um, what what we're seeing now is that you know, the, the the digital, the, the, the bits are becoming every bit as critical to our physical experience as the atoms. So let's start let's talk about paths. So you know, think about paths today, you can think about roads, you can think about you know, bus routes and the signs for them. If you think about the, the, the digital enhanced version of a path, here's, here's Uber Hop. And this is an example of a dynamic bus service that Uber has been piloting out in Seattle where you can see your virtual bus by the color of the LED light on the, on the windshield. Uh, and so it's no longer you know, waiting at a particular bus stop, yet there is still some notion of a path. It's just the digital version of it. Now let's talk about an edge, and this is this is my favorite example. When you think about an edge, you know, when you're growing up, you often hear people talk about being on the other side of the tracks, um, and the the railroad tracks were often an edge. Um, now people are sort of embracing this in the digital world, and this is what's called a digital exchange zone. Anyone know what this is? Okay, so so there's uh, this is a place for, to do Craigslist transactions, and so they the. The city has put cameras here, and it's wired directly into the police uh, uh, police office. And so, in theory, it's a safe place to do transactions. Although I, you wonder what happens on the edge. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of people with cash walking around. Um, uh, but it's interesting. So you, now you have a digitally created edge, if you will. Um, and then you know, nodes. I mentioned um, you know, there's all kinds of nodes in a city. You think about you know, just at Union Station in D.C. this morning. Um, you can think about sort of checking in at the airport as a node where, where kind of two worlds come together. And now with, um, with you know, wearables and you know, things like digital locks, the, the, the very definition of what is a node changes. You know, you know, when you check in a hotel now, in many cases you don't have to go to the front desk, you go straight to the room. Or you think about Airbnb and you're not even in a hotel anymore. And so, so that the notion of kind of these, these, these nodes as, as orienting um, kind of objects in a city changes or has a capacity to change. And then the district, you know, we all, we all think about sort of neighborhoods or districts uh, as having distinct physical character when you enter them. Um, you know, but now we have, you know, virtual districts, right? You look at a list in, in Foursquare and you can, you can think about sort of carving up Manhattan into thousands of districts, each with their own character and, uh, and that providing a whole new dimension of sort of experience. And then lastly, the landmark. Um, I think this will be, I think this will, you will what we think about as landmarks will, will persist for quite some time. But then again, you look at, uh, you look at the youth 
and um, you look at sort of Snapchat geo filters, and, and that's every bit as uh, much of a landmark for people as, uh, as the Eiffel Tower. And what you see here is you know, taking a picture in a particular location to, to get a geo filter and you know, being able to use that as a reference point for your friends you know, wherever they are. Um, and so you know, these, are, these are very early signs of change. You know, we start to see, you know, like I was, said, the, sort of the bits influence the user experience every bit as much as the atoms. Um, and what uh, I want to do next is hand it over to, to, to Craig to talk about what's next. So one of the things we've been thinking a lot about at, at Sidewalk, and, and we should say that we're actually pretty young at Sidewalk. We're really just beginning to think about these issues. Uh, Alan's been thinking about this a lot longer than I have. Um, but we're, we're, as a company, we're only about six months old. So we're starting to think through these issues. But one of the things we think is important is not just to think about cities as they are now and some of the changes we can make on the ground, but think into the future, decades into the future, and, and try and see where cities are going and think about how that influences what we do right now in order to prepare for that and to start to think about it. So here's, here's an example. So um, self-driving cars are getting better and better. Um, and I think in the limit, uh, the vast majority of, of, of cars will be self-driving, and it will be rare for individuals to be driving themselves. I, but let, let's do a bit of a crowdsourced uh, uh, a sense of this. So, so who, who agrees with, with me that sort of in the long run, self-driving cars will, will sort of dominate, and it will be a rarity to, I feel like it's two thirds, maybe it's going up to 80%. Actually, this is almost everybody. OK, I think maybe 80, 85% of you, you agree with me so far. So one question is, well, we're going to figure out how, how long this is going to take. So who thinks that'll happen uh, by 50 years? In 50 years' time, mostly it'll be. Right, so keep your hands up. So keep your hands up if you think it'll happen uh, in the next 30 years. OK, a few hands down. We're still over 50%. What about uh, 20 years? Will this happen within 20 years? Uh, I think we're right at the 50 percent mark. Who, who thinks that that uh, that uh, self-driving cars will be pervasive in 10 years? Okay, so somewhere about sort of I would say based on this crowd, sometime about 20, 15 years from now is when it will happen. We should sort of write that down and check back in <laughs> in uh, 2031. Um, so one of the implications, there's a whole bunch of implications, a whole bunch of which I don't think we really understand yet. But one that people have talked about um, is the idea that, that parking itself will go away. Uh, that is a huge amount of space within cities to be devoted to parking will sort of disappear. So the argument is this. If you have a lot of self-driving cars, let's assume that, that it's not the current ownership model where everybody owns their own car. Um, so now you, know, you go from home to work, and when you get to work and you get out of the self-driving car, it's not just going to sit there and wait for like 10 hours for you to come back out again like a puppy. It's, it's going to probably go off and like pick somebody else up who needs a ride and take them around. Now, eventually, uh, supply, the demand will sort of drop a little bit, maybe in the middle of the night, um, and the cars will go off somewhere. But they don't have to hang out like in front of your house or in front of your work. They can go off somewhere sort of unobtrusive. They need to recharge because they're probably electric, right? So basically, you're not going to have all the on-street parking and all the parking building that exists in cities right now. And, and it's interesting, over the last few months, as I've been sort of thinking about these issues, it's kind of shocking in different cities how much space is devoted to parking. I mean, Manhattan's one thing, but you know, many other cities devote even more of their space to, to parking. Um, so if that, that use really goes away, what do we do with all that space? Uh, it's sort of an interesting positive challenge to think about, does that become green space? Does that become productive space that we can use for other things? Do we have more bike lanes? And so on and so on. Those are really good questions. Uh, an even more interesting question is when you think about the growth of cities, and there are lots of estimates uh, about the growth of cities over the next few decades, that essentially say that it's conservatively hundreds of millions, if not billions of people will move from rural environments into cities over the next few decades. Um, and so cities are going to grow. And as they grow, what do, what do um, thought experiments like this say about how you design those cities? You know, maybe you shouldn't design parking in. Uh, as, as cities grow and as you have new cities. So at Sidewalk, we're really trying to think about what the implications of things like self-driving cars are uh, on essentially the built environment, but also the digital environment. Um, so Anand's going to talk about a different, uh, a different aspect of the built environment. This is, yeah, solars. So, so in this connects, so, so if you think about the, if, if the logical conclusion of self-driving cars is to really make you know, transportation almost entirely programmable. Um, you know that's that's going to change the built environment too. And you know when we right now when we think about buildings, you look at a building like this. Um, 
you know, this is a massive building. It's been here for, how long has this building been here? Uh, it's been here 80 years. Eight, 80 years, right? And um, the, the permanence of the building and the size and the density is often derived from the transportation system. We People talk about trans, you know, transit-oriented development, putting in a train line and building around it. Um, if, if now with you know, if these, these cars that can be pooled dynamically and you know, provisioned, um, you know, if, if that exists, that changes how we think about land use and you know, what, what's, what size a building is. You know, does it always stay that size? You know, can it change and grow? And so you know, one, one approach um, that, uh, that's been proposed actually by Google on its Mountain View campus is a, is a radically different you know, play on buildings. And what you see here is, in this case, it's, it's glass. It could be a plastic canopy, very large scale canopy. Um, where that, that structure creates uh, a waterproof, windproof region within which the structures can be radically simple. And at the limit, can actually be moved around by robots and reconfigured and you know, moved up and down. What you see on the left here is what are called crane robots or craybots. And, um, and you know, this is, this is, this is you know, in part um, R&D, but you know, there's aspects of this that are gonna become real very, very soon. And you can see two things here. One, you know, the, the, the connection between creating essentially a software programmable transportation system, which is what self-driving cars suggest. And then, and then secondly, um, you know, really you know, freeing the built environment from kind of the shackles of, of, of innovation and, and really kind of freeing your imagination to, to see what's possible. And so you know, th this, is, this is one, one possibility for you know, what a city in the future might look like. Um, but uh, I think it's important for us to recognize that you know digital platforms and the kinds of um, you know built environment that they enable, they're, it's not inevitably going to be good for the city. You know, just like Craig mentioned earlier, previous transitions they had their downsides, and um, you know just you, you can look no further than than Hollywood to to, sh to see some examples. Um, <laughs> everyone everyone's seen Wall-E. Uh, you know, this is uh, this is maybe not the future that we that we hope for, um, and you know, there, there's it, it's it's really interesting actually to look at um, you know Hollywood's critiques of cities of the future. Uh, the, another another one that's interesting to look at is uh, is Minority Report, which which had in some ways a little more of a positive view, but you could see at the at the edges some of the challenges. And, and issues that, that society was grappling with, this idea of pre-crimes, and if we have all this you know, amazing data, you know, to what what are the limits? You know, where where do we where do we want to draw the line in terms of public safety uh, and you know civil liberties? And so it was really really hard questions for us to confront. And so um, you know our approach at Sidewalk, uh, as 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 Craig mentioned is really to immerse ourselves in in these cities of the future, in the in the different possibilities, but then to step back and say, look, what kind of cities do we want to create? And you know, our, our view is that the the cities of the future they have to really be designed uh, to be not only efficient but also to be equitable and human, and and we need to be really intentional about that so that. Um, we don't, uh, you know, repeat some of the same kind of catastrophes that have occurred throughout sort of the history of technology in cities. Um, but it's 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 not enough to kind of be thinkers and dreamers. We also need to be living in the present. And so the other the other you know half of our approach is about solving you know, the the pressing urban problems that exist today in ways that bridge these cities of the future. And um, and I want to hand it over to to Craig to talk about sort of how we have one foot in the, in, the, in the present, one foot in the future. Thanks. So we've started to think at a very high level about what the sort of the digital infrastructure of a city could look like. Uh, and I've made kind of a, an analogy, a little bit of a stretched analogy, uh, but with operating systems, computer operating systems, and the kind of thing that exists within the Google infrastructure, for example. At the bottom, we've got the city itself. And we've got essentially input and output that allows us to understand the city through sensors, through people moving around the city with their phones, through traffic, air quality, and so on. So input coming coming into uh, our digital platform, and then output as well. So this is this allows the city 
the digital platform to influence what happens in the city. So you can imagine traffic lights are part of that story, intelligent door, digitally controllable door, not, uh, door locks, so you can, for example, um, you have yourself let in or on the weekend when friends are visiting, let them in and so on. Um, or apps, apps that people are using to navigate the city, for example, are in a way is ways, ways that um, uh, the digital infrastructure can influence what happens in the city, what direction people drive, and so on. So above that, I, I sort of, you know, um, again, using this analogy of a, of a software stack, this is the kernel, so this is connectivity. We need connectivity throughout the city. We need permissions. We need a layer that makes sure that people have access to only the things they should have access to. And, and ground traffic control this is essentially ha having the city coordinate what happens uh, in, in terms of the roads and circulation. On top of that, services, things like the 4D map, where we're saying knowing where uh, vehicles and other objects are in, in 3D space over time and in real time. Analytics and simulation to understand what's going on in the city, but then to understand, A, what might happen next, but also to simulate if we change this, we, if we added a road or um, you know, change the light timing, you know, what would happen in the city? And demand management, because uh, cities have scarce resources, things like uh, road segments and so on. So making sure and parking until we get to the, to the end state where maybe we don't have parking. Um, but we need to allocate these resources carefully and using demand management and dynamic pricing to do that. And then on top of that, essentially the user-facing application. So transportation apps to help people get around, citizen services, which are maybe like a 311 app on steroids, and city administration apps that allow the leaders of the city to take action, to understand the city, and then to take action and to make good decisions about planning. So I just want to pick a couple of these really quickly. One is connectivity and, and combined with that citizen services. Um, and here's a shocking statistic that 30%, 36% of New York City households who are below the poverty line and the number below the poverty line is a shockingly high number in New York City. But 36% 30, of those, those households don't have access to internet at home. So think about that for a second. If you suddenly were cut off from your internet access at home, um, how hard it w would be for your kids to do their homework, uh, for you to access city services, for you to access the world at large, to get a job, and so on. So kind of a shocking statistic. Um, and then when we look at the current public infrastructure for who said payphones before? For payphones, uh, for, for communication, this is essentially the state of the art. So Sidewalk, one of the first things that Sidewalk has done is made a major investment in a company called Intersection, which is replacing payphones with the things you see on the right, these link, uh, link NYC devices. So these, uh, every place there's a payphone, and there are about 8,000 of those places throughout New York City, there's going to arise one of these. They're about nine feet tall. Uh, and they have screens on each side, and at the top they have a, a, an RF transparent area where we have uh, Wi-Fi. Each of these have a, has a fiber connection back to a central point, um, and they each provide gigabit Wi-Fi. And you can see some of the reactions from Gizmodo and the gadget. And the bottom left, this is a screenshot by Gizmodo showing standing, basically standing out in the street. I think probably with a laptop, like um, you know, getting 436 megabits per second download speed. So these are kind of amazing bits of technology, uh, paid for by the advertising on the screens. Uh, they contribute money back to New York City. Um, and we're going to be rolling those out. I think there's sort of 20 or 30 out right now. Uh, most of them are along 3rd Avenue, starting at 15th Street and sort of marching up. So if you want to check one out, head over, head over there. Um, so here are uh, a, a number of, um, uh, of renderings of these out in the wild. Uh, they're going to be throughout New York City, so the Bronx, Staten Island, Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, um, and they're going to be super accessible. And people have started using these from their um, from their apartments. They're, they're actually, you know, actually pretty accessible. Um, so this is an exciting. By the way, I should point out that in addition to providing Wi-Fi access, there is a keypad. There's a there's a tablet on there, an Android tablet uh, that allows people to make free phone calls. So they're sort of backwards compatible to your payphone point. <laughs> The only, the only difference is there's no slot to put 25 cents in because they're free. Um, and there's even a place to charge your uh, phone. So you can uh, actually, here's a better photo. So you can use Google Maps, charge your phone, make a 911 call, make a 311 call, or use the 311 app, and so on. So this is, this is new infrastructure that's currently rolling out as part of Sidewalk's mission that we're super, super excited about. Um, so to talk about a f uh, another example, here's uh, Anand. 
oh, sorry, and just one, just before, I, I, one of the intersection people emailed me about half an hour ago and said, hey, hey remember, we're hiring too, so uh, intersection is hiring. If you want to be involved in projects like this, intersection.com. It's an idea for Google Slides, dynamic ad insertion. So, um, <laughs> So, you know, Craig talked about one pressing urban problem, the digital divide, and you can see how we approach that with, uh, with a commercially viable product. Um, I, I want to talk about another, you know, really pressing urban problem, um, you know, that's focused on transportation. And you know, th just to underscore the point that, that Craig made earlier, when we look at, at problems, we have sort of one foot in the present and one foot in the future. And and in the case of transportation, we talked about these great things called self-driving cars that are going to come. Uh, but we're also, we're also anchored in the reality that you know, most people don't have them today, and there's a long road to go. Uh, and, we're also, and, and so when we look at these problems, we're thinking about how do we do things today that bridge to that future. Um, and that's, and, and you, know, you have this platform diagram here for a reason, which is I think that by solving these problems today, we can create these bridges to the future and start to build build out a platform to pull that city of the future forward. When we think about transportation, there's a really interesting and you know, sort of sad uh, trend that's occurred in the last 10 years. Um, if, you, if you take the typical poor resident in a metropolitan area, the number of jobs that they can access within a reasonable commute has actually declined by almost 20%. And this is really understates the problem. The other 80% in most cases have also had much longer commutes. And so you have a real issue now where transportation is causing both financial poverty, the inability to get to jobs, and time poverty. And, um, and, this, and this is not an accident. You know, this is really a direct result of uh, the way that we've thought about you know, kind of transportation um, in the US and much of the world. You know, for the last 50 years, we've thought about the outcomes that we want to shape around transportation and said, look, the answer to shaping those outcomes is to pour concrete, to build highways. Uh, and that was a very intentional plan. It, and you know, part of part of that plan was also sorry for the geeky chart um, was giving away lots of free parking. Uh, and this what this chart shows is that as uh, as you put more parking spaces in a place, you know, along the x-axis, turns out that more people drive, um, and and that's uh, not not a shock. And the the problem with this is it doesn't scale. Uh, we we have congestion issues, uh, and that's driving the the problem that you saw in the previous slide. And you know the wealthier among us can can sort by income. They can go, decide to go live closer to jobs, but the people that are less wealthy are unable to do that, and so they they're suffering. Um, you know, we think there's a new model. Uh, we think there's a new model for how for how you can think about driving transportation outcomes. The starting point is really first of all figuring out what your problem is actually, and this is this is this is a huge gap in the way that transportation planning works, uh, and. And we, we think there's an amazing opportunity to solve this using the smartphones that we all have. Today, if you go to most cities and you ask them, how many parking spots do you have? And how utilized are they? Most of the time, you're going to get blank stares. And uh, you know, there's the, the, the state of the art up until a few years ago was to spend $300 to put a sensor in each spot. And, and that's just crazy. Cities can't afford to do that. Uh, similarly, if you, if you ask most cities, you know. Um, who's using your streets? Where are they trying to go? What's driving congestion? You'll get largely, largely blank stares, or, or in the best case, um, you know, out of date surveys. And and so in both cases, we think that using the data from smartphones and other sources, there's a, there's an opportunity to really revolutionize the the base understanding of of what's happening in a transportation network. Now, understanding is nice, but you know we really care about driving driving action and changing behavior, solving that the commute problem that we talked about. Um, and it, you know, it's not like the tools are are, are sort of rocket science. You know, yes, self-driving cars are going to make transit much much better. But we have we have transit today. We have sharing services today. And so a big part of the challenge is providing information and, dry, and, and the right incentives to change people's behavior. And uh, you know, one, one sort of example. You know, we've 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 referenced this a couple times, but um, you know, this is this is one that we think is is a real opportunity. Is is really looking at the driving experience and starting to um, focus on uh, on how we manage parking as a place to start. And the reason this is so important is that uh, the parking is a huge factor in congestion and, and encouraging road use. And so, 
one of the one of the challenges today is that there just simply isn't good information, right? When you when you navigate to a, a destination, you typical typically in your navigation app it doesn't tell you that it's going to take you another you know 25 minutes to circle around and find a spot, right? And so just by exposing that information to people, we can start to help them make the right decisions. And you know this requires you know hard uh, data science in the back end. It, hard, it requires really sort of you know novel thinking around the user experience. This isn't a confusing experience. But if you do it right, we can start to expose this information. And then not only do we expose information, we can start to expose alternative choices, right? So uh, if, you, if you know in advance it's going to take you 25 minutes to, to get a spot, well, maybe you should purchase a spot. Maybe you should, or maybe you shouldn't even drive at all. Maybe you should take transit or park and ride. And, uh, and you can see how this, this sort of you know, relatively simple example is is really you know, creating a new form of infrastructure, if you will, for transportation that's built around information, it's built around engaging citizens, and it does so in a way that creates uh, more capacity for, for everyone. And you know, like I said earlier, this is this is about sort of more than just parking. Uh, you know, if we can free this the shared space that we have on the street, so it's not just for your car that's parked for you know ten hours a day, but it's for bike share, it's for dynamic transit, um, then we can, we, can, we can enable more people to get to where they need to go. And then, you know, if we fast forward to whatever the year we picked, was Tw it 20 2031. 2031, we can fill this in. Um, you know, we won't even need those parking spots anymore. Uh, so just the last thing I want to I reiterate, so we have this, this fancy stack diagram, and you know, our approach is to approach the is is to think about this incrementally, right? You you, you looked at sort of what we're doing with Link, what we're doing with uh, with transportation and parking, but I think it's really important for us to to also think about the full stack. To use kind of Silicon Valley you know terminology, what if you could innovate across the entire stack all at once? What would happen? What, what would be different about a city? Uh, you know, I think you know, we 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 think at Sidewalk that possibility is not just um, an imaginary one that it, that it's a real possibility, and you know the reality is we're, we're you know the the world is collectively building cities all the time. There are opportunities to reimagine the full stack, and uh, and you know what we'd love to uh, you know hear from you both after this presentation, but also on an ongoing basis is what your ideas are. What are what are the ideas if you have the opportunity to reimagine the city from the ground up? What's what could be possible? Um, so with that, I'd love to um, I'd love to kind of invite Craig up, and we'll be happy to take questions. Right, and to drive the point home, we are to state the obvious. Yeah, yeah. We are we are hiring engineers and product managers, uh, and other roles. So um, so if you're in, uh, we're going to be a pretty small team, but a, a pretty small and great team. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, if this is your passion, and you're a great software en engineer, or a great product manager, go to our website uh, and uh, apply. Actually, let me mention one other thing, which is. This this is this is sort of one um, metaphor we use to talk about some of the things we're doing. Um, but stepping back, you know, solving solving the problems for making cities better is it's a vast problem space. And one thing I should mention in terms of how we approach it, I talked about sort of going problem by problem. Craig, Craig mentioned having a small team. Our model really is to is to pick off specific problems, uh, try out solutions, and then as they become more promising, then we go deploy capital and resources against it. And so today we're about 15. We'll be doubling that team. But as we as we come up with ideas, we'll often decide to go form companies around them, and those could be very large. Um, and so think about it as a sort of a small high leverage. Exactly.